All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, here we are. The penultimate, I mean, it's the second to last video lecture that we're doing for this unit, for this semester, um, is upon us. We're going to finish the conversation that we started last week with the reproductive system and actual reproduction. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the sequence of events that take place after fertilization or conception has taken place. Um, and so mom is pregnant. Let's see what happens to mom. Um, dads, there's not really much to do in this one at the physiological level. Lots of stuff that you can do on the emotional level, um, but that's for a different course. So let's, um, Let's discuss what happens with um, uh, baby development. So we have uh, some terms that we're going to start off with first, and then we'll get into some of the sequences. So we're starting off, we're talking about development. And that's just the gradual modification of um, structures and characteristics uh, uh, over time, from a, an undifferentiated mass of cells to a human. Um, and beyond that, actually, from once uh, birth happens, development still continues. We can divide the development into different stages. I guess you can say the first one is prenatal development. That is the embryonic and fetal development stages. That's um, inside mama, basically. Postnatal is after that. So basically from birth onward um, that goes through maturity and then... Um, basically ends when we pass away. Uh, maturity is basically when development has stopped. Um, growth is complete. Uh, development of organs and processes is complete and so on and so forth. You are physiologically an adult, basically. Um, different stages of development within um, prenatal and postnatal. Prenatal development, you have pre-embryonic development. That's the first two weeks of fertilization um, where you would just have a mass of cells and we end up going into an embryo. The, from there, we have embryonic development that is occurring during uh, the third through eight weeks. Uh, studying these events is known as embryology. And then from there, after about week nine or so, we have fetal development, so now the baby is no longer an embryo. It is considered a fetus. Uh, and then this development continues through the rest of the pregnancy. This is um, an image of an egg, an oocyte, an ovum. No, sorry, not an ovum. Surrounded by sperm cells. And this image is very striking because it gives us an idea of um, the difference in size between the egg and the sperm. Um, and this is where fertilization is going to take place. And so we know that egg and sperm are haploid. That means they have one set, one pair, well, yeah, one set of chromosomes. Okay. Normally we're diploid. We have two pairs. Um, so the sperm, the little squigglies, they're going to, um, they're going to carry paternal or dad's genetic information. And then the oocyte, which is the big one, is going to carry everything else. And so this is why uh, if we do genetic testing and you do mitochondrial testing, it only gives you information on the mother's line because this cell is going to be the first cell of the baby. The sperm just provides genetic material. The rest of the structures end up dissolving away. Um, the secondary oocyte, remember, is released from the ovary. It's surrounded by the zona pellucida, which is a, a, an envelope of glycoproteins. 
And then around that is the corona radiata, which is a protective layer of cells. The zona pellucida, remember, is, is, is uh, thinking like a membrane, I guess you could think, um, separating the oocyte from the corona radiata. Uh, that was from back at the beginning. And so this is kind of what it looked like, right? Once the oocyte is released, you have the first polar body, which is um, not going to develop into a, uh, a future human, basically. Um, and we start to have um, formation of uh, little spindle fibers to get ready for the continuation of meiosis. We haven't gotten there yet because fertilization has to take place. Now, fertilization uh, happens, uh, theoretically should happen within a day or so after ovulation within the, the uterine tube, okay? Um, it's gonna go a few centimeters in and then uh, the sperm has to cover the rest of the difference. Now, also remember we had mentioned something called uh, capacitation, right? And that's getting the sperm ready to be able to penetrate the oocyte to actually initiate fertilization. Um, and so this first step is happening within the male when the sperm comes in contact with seminal secretions and then uh, the female reproductive tract will continue that process to get it ready. So with the actual fertilization process, um, the acrosome, remember, is the, the sort of the cap of the sperm is going to release enzymes that are going to uh, penetrate the corona radiata. Now, there's two proteins that are going to be released. Um, hyaluronidase, hyaluronidase, I should have practiced that, um, is going to break down the bonds in between these cells right here uh, that are forming the... The, that cellular layer around the oocyte. Uh, and then uh, another protein called acrosin is gonna help penetrate that um, zona pellucida to get to the actual egg itself. Uh, once the sperm actually makes it in, as we can see, this little guy made it. Good for you, little one. Um, we're going to activate the oocyte. And that's going to be triggered when the sperm actually penetrates that cell membrane of the oocyte. Um, which is going to have, you're going to have exchanges of ions. Sodium ions are going to be um, released. You'll have uh, calcium ions that are going to be released into the cell. Um, and that's going to stimulate something called the cortical reaction, which we'll talk about here in just a second. And then begin that process of meiosis to forming those other polar bodies right there. Uh, metabolic rate is also going to increase because now, since fertilization happened, things are going to start moving really, really fast. All right. So we have the sperm has come in. Now what we're going to have is something called um, pro-nuclei are going to develop. Now I had mentioned, let me back up before that, something called the cortical reaction. Okay. And so basically a bunch of enzymes are going to be released um, within the oocyte that are going to uh, inactivate other sperm, sperm receptors around the outside of the egg. And it's also going to harden that zone of pellucida basically making an impenetrable shield. So no other sperm can come in. What we want to do is we're trying to block a condition known as polyspermy, okay? Uh, that's more than one sperm coming in. The problem is if more than one sperm comes in, um, that's going to inactivate the egg. It's going to make it um, uh, um, non-viable, okay? And so the pregnancy is not going to go any farther. And so this cortical reaction is stops any other sperm from coming in. Now you may be thinking, well, what about twins, right? You're getting different genetic information. Um, that happens after fertilization. We still only have one sperm coming in, okay? Um, meiosis, uh, the oocyte at this point is going to cr finish going through meiosis two, and now we're gonna change the terminology. Now it is technically an ovum, okay? O, B, U, M. 
Um, so after this, we're going to have the two pro nuclei um, are going to move towards each other. We're going to have centrioles are going to start to form again um, uh, and start rolling out spindle fibers to get ready for the first um, cell division. Okay. Um, from there, the two pro nuclei are going to fuse together. Uh, in a process known as uh, amphimixis. Okay, let me get my highlighter. So amphimixis, those two pronuclei are going to fuse together, okay, and now uh, mitosis is going to start. Um, this is the moment of conception, okay. Uh, now what we have is a zygote and we are diploid once again. So that means we've got two copies of everything. Uh, and so the process of fertilization is complete. And now we're going to get into the, the actual stages of development. And so basically we're going to have something known as um, cleavage. And that is the, uh, the first division of your cell into two daughter cells. And these daughter cells are going to be known as blastomeres. Um, and then there's not actually really that much that happens after this, um, at least not particularly noteworthy. We're just going to have a series of divisions every few hours or so. Um, going through the different process. Now, bef now, so fertilization has taken place. I'm going to get into some of those other divisions here in just a second. Now what we're getting into is something known as gestation. Uh, gestation is just a fancy word, kind of a sterile word for talking about um, baby's time spent in development, uh, prenatal development, okay? Um, in humans, we typically, when we're talking about gestation, you're family and your doctors or doctors probably don't refer to it as gestation, but you've probably heard trimesters. So in humans, gestation is um, in the neighborhood of uh, three, three month trimesters. It's actually a little bit longer than that. Um, it's technically closer to 10 months, but it's easier to break it up into three. And then there's also flexibility as far as uh, when babies are born um, and how they're developed and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So typically we think about it, we have trimesters, each lasting approximately three months long. That is human gestation. Different animals have different gestational periods. Elephants, for example, have a 24 month. That means mom is pregnant for two years. Um, Whales have a particularly long one. Um, other animals are very, very short, a number of weeks, a number of days even um, in, for some species. So when we're looking at uh, trimesters, the first trimester is the pre-embryonic th uh, stage through early fetal development. Um, the starting points of all the major organs uh, are going to be developed here. Now this trimester, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. Well, so this, this trimester is super, super important because uh, if you have disruptions here, they could have huge effects um, later on in life going on after birth and stuff like that. Second trimester is going to continue development of organs and organ systems. The body shape and the proportion is going to change. This is the time where baby's going to start looking less like a weird lizard baby and more like a cute baby baby. Third trimester is uh, characterized by rapid growth and deposition of adipose tissue. So they're going to kind of chunk up a little bit, right? Um, at this point, most major organ systems are fully functional. We're just getting big, basically, is what's happening here. So first trimester, there's four general processes that are taking place during this time. Okay, we've got cleavage, which we kind of just talked about. I'm going to bring that up again. Implantation. Plus, placentation and embryogenesis. Okay, now, like I said, this is important, but it's also very dangerous. 
Um, believe it or not, and I didn't actually know this, 40% of conceptions produce embryos that survive the first trimester. And so this is kind of, if you've ever heard people, if you've ever heard stories of, of, of people having difficulty um, conceiving and carrying babies to term and stuff like that, um, uh, this this is why a lot of stuff can happen, and if a small change that happens here, especially early on, can have catastrophic uh, effects, um, and a lot of things can go wrong to lead to an un, uh, inviolable um, embryo. That's also why a lot of people will typically wait. There's a uh, waiting period within this first trimester where that people will wait before making the announcement that they're going to have a baby because there's if they meet certain milestones then they can get everybody's hopes up and get everybody excited um so the different stages we have cleavage which is a sequence of cell divisions that began as soon as fertilization takes place um your zygote is going to turn into a pre-embryo it's going to de develop into something called a blastocyst and i'll show you that in just a second um this is going to end when the blastocyst contacts the uterine wall. So after fertilization takes place, if you picture the um, uh, embryo, the fallopian tubes in the uterus in your head, um, fertilization took place in the uterine tube. Once fertilization takes place, baby's going to start moving into the actual uterus part. Uh, once it comes in contact with the uterine wall, that's implantation. Implantation... Um, baby's going to stick to the intometrium of the uterus and it's going to set the stage for formation of uh, embryonic structures, uh, including the placenta. That's pl placentation. Um, so blood vessels around the blastocyst uh, are going to form and uh, eventually turn into something called the placenta. That's the exchange tissue between mom and baby. Um, interesting bit of trivia. Um... The placenta also kind of like tells mom's immune system, hey, everybody's cool here, situation normal, um, how about you? Except that time it actually works. You don't have the empire coming down and be like, oh my God. Um, otherwise, uh, mom's immune system would view baby as a foreign invader and try to kill it. So interesting bit of, of trivia. That's one of my favorite things that I learned when I was in college. So once the basically once the placenta develops around the baby, you have embryogenesis, and that's just the formation of a viable embryo. Um, and you're going to have tissue layers start to develop that are going to turn into all of the major organ systems that we've talked about this entire school year. Okay. Um, let's see. So embryogenesis, we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about that one. Um, this occurs during a process known as gastrulation, um, which is this uh, germ layer formation. That's what we call um, uh, these different, different layers. Okay. Um, and basically what ends up happening, short version, is a lot of these cells that have been... Um, forming just as a sort of blob are going to start migrating to different areas based on certain chemical cues. Uh, that's known as induction. Um, and so as they move, based on where they move, they're going to make layers like a cake. Okay, we're going to get three layers. Uh, a lot of other organisms only have two. Um, the evolutionary significance of the third one is huge because um, it leaves a lot of like connective tissue and stuff like that. So the three germ layers from outside is ectoderm, then it's mesoderm in the middle, endoderm on the inside. So let's take a little bit of time and let's talk about those. Um, so uh, the organ systems that are going to arise from the ectoderm. You ready for this? All right. Uh, the ectoderm is going to be responsible for the epidermis, hair, nails, hair follicles, of the uh, integumentary system, also glands that communicate with the squid, skin, uh, sweat glands, oil glands, stuff like that. Skeletal system, we're talking primarily around the cartilage that forms around your larynx. There's a bunch of cartilage, we didn't really talk about that. Nervous system is going to be 100% developed from ectoderm. Uh, moving on, we've got uh, endocrine system, the uh, adrenal medulli, which is uh, 
this part right here and the pituitary gland. We're also going to have, um, let's see, the mucus uh, epithelia of the nasal passages uh, are going to form here. Not all of the respiratory system, just the nasal passages part uh, up here at the top. The digestive system, we're going to have the salivary glands and the mucus epithelium of the mouth. We're going to get the rest of the tract here in just a little bit. What else do we got? We're going to do mesoderm now. Um, mesoderm, we're going to have the uh, dermis is going to be formed by the mesoderm. The, your skeletal system um, is going to be completely, well, everything except for the um, uh, cartilage around the pharynx. Your muscular system is going to derive from mesodermal tissue. The adrenal cortex of um, the adrenal glands that sit on top of your kidneys, um, the exocrine tissues of the heart, the other parts of the kidneys and the gonads are going to be mesoderm. All the structures of the cardiovascular system, including the blood vessels, the, all the structures of the lymphatic system. Um, let's see, what else? The urinary system, including everything from the kidneys, except for what we just mentioned earlier, the reproductive system. Uh, including the gonads and the adjacent parts of the adduct system, the linings of the um, body cavity, the pleural cavities, the pericardial cavities, and the peritoneal cavities, um, the connective tissues that support all of the organ systems, so all that fascia and everything like that, um, ligaments, tendons, things like that, uh, are all going to come from the mesoderm. Endoderm um, is basically going to give us um, all of the middle bits, basically. So the thymus, the thyroid, and the pancreas for the endocrine system. The respiratory system is going to be all the respiratory endothelium. The digestive system is going to be the mucus epithelium of everything else except for the mouth. So basically all the inside parts uh, right here and here and stuff like that. Along with the exocrine glands, like the pancreas, except the salivary glands, because that was exo ectoderm. Uh, the liver as well are also going to be um, going to do that. Uh, so basically, all the insidey bits, plus um, the parts of the urinary tract, like the um, the distal portions of the duct system. So uh, like this part right here, plus the bladder. And the reproductive systems are going to be the distal portion of the duct systems. Um, let me go back. Um, and the stem cells that produce the gametes. So like if you remember in, in women, they've got two tubes that leave outside. Men only have one. So that last part of the reproductive tract in women is going to be formed by the endoderm. Okay, so back to stages. We're going to do the embryonic period first. That's implantation to week nine. Um, differentiation is going to take place, which is going to involve the genetic activity of some cells, but not others. Some cells are going to learn to be like head cells and foot cells and stuff like that, and other cells aren't. Um, we have this process known as induction. That's when the, how basically how this happens. So different chemicals are going to be released, which are going to cause cells to move to different places and have certain parts of their DNA activated and other parts deactivated. Okay. Um, and so it's a way for a very complex process to happen in a relatively simple um, mass of cells at this point. So we've got, let's backtrack a little bit. We've got cleavage. Remember those four processes, right? Cleavage implantation, placentation, and embryogenesis, right? So we're back here to cleavage. Um, we're going to have the formation of blastomeres, which are ident genetically identical cells. So at this point, it's just mitosis. We're just, um, things are developing. Um, each day or so, we have a, uh, a division. So there's a two-cell stage, a four-cell stage, an eight-cell stage, um, which is actually known as a um, Morula has about eight cells or so. You have an advanced Morula, which happens about day four, which is just more cells. Um, uh, it looks kind of like a mulberry, if you know what a mulberry is. If you don't know what a mulberry is, think of like a blackberry, I guess. Um, 
Uh, after about day four or five, it's going to be migrating, as you notice, because it's been migrating this whole time. By about day four or five, so, you know, about here-ish, right before here-ish. Day six is, a, is basically implantation. So we are um, here. It's going to come down. Here's day six. Things are kind of starting to differentiate a little bit. And then day seven to 10 is when implantation is actually going to happen. Well, uh, what we're going to have now, we don't have a blasto mirror anymore or a morula. We have no, what's known as a blastocyst. A blastocyst is uh, basically a hollow ball. The inside is called a blastoceal. Uh, seal. Uh, blasto seal seal uh refers to a cavity okay um and the blastomeres those individual cells are no longer identical they're starting to become different okay we also have something called a um, trophoblast which is the outer layer of the um blastocyst with that empty space being the blastoceal um we have an inner cell mass. That's what it's called because I guess they just ran out of it, uh, ran out of inspiration or something like that. Um, that's going to cluster at one end of the blastocyst, uh, and it's going to end up being isolated from contact by something called the tro by the trophoblast by that outside right. And so basically, if you look at the other. Um, so if you look here, and I'll zoom into that here in just a second, um, the inner mass of cells when the embryo implants is going to be towards the inside, and you're going to have this sort of layer forming like a buffer outside of it or something like that. Uh, that inner mass of cells is going to form the embryo. Okay, so future little baby. Uh, about, so we're going into about a week or so. Implantation is going to take place. And so we have our blastocyst. It's going to go inner mass first. It's going to come in contact with the uterine wall. And it's going to stick. And it can kind of bury itself into it um, in there. And so now we're going to have, we're going to start to have divisions. We're going to have something known as the cytotropho trofo blast, uh, which are the cells closest to the interior of the blastocyst. And then we're going to have something called the syncytiotropho blast. Try saying that one time fast, not even five. Um, which is the outer layer of the um, tropo blast. And it's going to help erode the inner layer of the uh, the uterus, the endometrium, uh, by secreting the hyaluronidase, so that stuff that the sperm released earlier. Now your the little baby is going to release that. Also, dissolve away the endometrium a little bit so it can sort of like weasel its way in. See how I mean about the whole invading organism sort of thing? Um, it definitely kind of seems like that, right? So... Um, some of the structures I want to point out here, we have something called lacunae, which I think we mentioned last time we had this conversation. Uh, these are channels that carry blood to the trophoblast, um, and those are going to be important in the next stage here that we're going to talk about in just a second. And we also have these structures called villi, um, which are these little guys right here. Or girls, I guess, they're, they're, they don't have a gender. Um, they're going to increase in size and complexity until about day 21, and they're going to be important for placenta formation and stuff like that. You're going to start forming within that inner mass of cells um, the amniotic cavity, uh, which is a fluid-filled chamber that... Uh, Eventually, it's going to form the, well, it's going to get bigger, and it's going to be where the baby basically sits. We'll talk about that in just a second. So they, that amniotic cavity is starting to form within that inner mass. Um, of the trophoblast. So this is all taking place in the uterus. However, there are 
some cases where you can have something called an ectopic pregnancy. And that's uh, anytime implantation happens someplace that isn't the uterus. It can be in the ovary and the fallopian tube, too deep in like into the myometrium of the uterus. It could be outside of the uterus entirely. It could be embedded in the cervix. Um, and they're bad news because uh, if not caught early enough, um, it can lead to comp complications. The embryo is not viable, so the baby does not develop. Um, it can lead to significant health issues with um, mom if it goes on too long and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's definitely bad news if it, if it comes up. Not terribly common, 0.6% of pregnancy, but um, you know, it happens enough. So uh, we have had implantation taking place. Now we're gonna get into placentation. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start developing extra embryonic membranes. And so these are membranes that are going to help the baby, but they're not directly, they're not directly rated to the development of the baby and its cell layers itself, okay? And we're gonna have four uh, tissues. Okay, the yolk sac, the amnion, the allantois, and the chorion. So we're going to start with the yolk sac. So it's basically kind of like the yolk in a, an egg, like a chicken egg or something like that. Um, it begins as a layer of cells that's going to expand um, into a pouch, basically. And it's going to be the primary source of nutrition for the baby until the, um, until the placenta is built and connected basically. Um, and there's also uh, initial blood cell formation takes place here before the baby's able to do that on its own. Because we know um, in humans, blood cell formation takes place in the bones and we don't have those yet, but we will. Until then, we're going to have the yolk sac. So from here, uh, we're going to have our uh, mesoderm is going to start forming. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, and so those, those mesodermal cells are going to move around the outside here like this. And they're going to form something called the chorion. Uh, the chorion is... Uh, the, the formation of the chorion is the first step in the development of the placenta. Uh, this is where we're going to have a lot of blood cell um, development taking place. Um, the, we're going to have the formation of chorionic villi, which are kind of similar to those villi that we had mentioned that are in the endometrium, where the, um, uh, that's where the actual, um, exchange between baby and mama is going to take place. We also have something called the amnion, which is the mesoderm and the ectoderm, um, combination. And um, that is, let's see, so it's right here. Um, we're gonna have ectodermal cells spread over the inner surface of the amniotic cavity that was forming. Um, and then the mesodermal cells are gonna come right after that. This is gonna continue to enlarge that uh, cavity and produce um, amniotic fluid which is important for protecting um, the baby while it's developing, especially when it gets bigger. Um, about this time, we're gonna have um, a process known as gastrulation, uh, which we kind of mentioned, formation of the germ cells and stuff like that, uh, in something called an embryonic disc. Okay, and so it's like a flat, it kind of looks like a disc, basically. Uh, it's an oval with three layers, all right. Um, this is where the body and the organs are going to form. You're also going to have what's known as a head fold and a tail fold, so you have that orientation. The development of a head is an important evolutionary milestone, and that's a very interesting conversation that you can have um, after you've watched this, basically, sort of the evolution of life and that sort of thing. Um, and so we've kind of been 
we kind of have the endoderm and the ectoderm forming uh, within the baby. Here is when we have the mesoderm. And if you notice, um, what we end up with is something called a primitive streak. And it's basically like a crease in the middle of this embryonic disc. Um, the cells in the middle of that disc are ectoderm cells, okay? But as they move to the center, they're going to change by induction into mesodermal cells. And you, so you can see those here in the middle. And so we've colored them. They look structurally different, colored different and stuff like that between ecto, meso, and endoderm. Uh, moving forward, going more into week three, uh, we're going to have the foreman the formation of the allantois. Um, it's, uh, begins as an outpocket of the embryonic sac of the yolk sac and, um, the base of that sac is what actually is going to turn into the urinary then from there, moving on about a week later after that, the embryo has a definite head and tail. And so here's the head fold I was telling you about and the tail fold, it kind of folds in on itself, right? So definitely definite head regions and tail regions. Um, the where the baby is connected to the mother is gonna start to narrow. The yolk sac is still gonna uh, persist. Here's the narrowing that we were talking about here. And eventually that's gonna become the um, umbilical cord that's gonna allow exchange between mama and baby through the placenta. Uh, other structures that are in there are the um, capsular decidua, which is a thin portion of the endometrium right uh, here. Um, that, uh, important characteristics, nutrient exchange doesn't take place there. Um, chorionic villi begin to disappear. And so that's why you don't have that, um, exchange taking place. We've also got the basal decidua, which is right here, which another layer, uh, a disc shaped layer deep, um, in the endometrium. Um, and that's where the placental functions are concentrated. So this whole area right here, that's the sort of main interface. And then the parietal decidua, this section right here, um, is just the rest of the uterine endometrium and there's not really any, anything else that happens right here. There's no contact with the chorion uh, that's taking place at this point. So, Here we are about week 10. The amnion has expanded considerably, um, taking up a huge amount of space of that uterine cavity. Uh, the fetus is now connected by uh, an umbilical cord that contains parts of the allantois blood vessels and the last remaining bits of the yolk sac. A mucus plug is gonna form um, at the cervix right here, and that's gonna prevent bacteria from coming in um, and and damaging the um, damaging the uh, baby at this point. Uh, the umbilical cord, we'll talk about that here for just a little bit. So the umbilical cord connects the fetus to the placenta. Um, it contains the allantois, placental blood vessels, and the um, yolk stock, uh, which is that connection between uh, for the yolk stack to the body, to the baby. Um, and as far as circulation is concerned, blood is going to flow from the fetus to the placenta by way of the umbilical arteries. That's the red parts. Um, and you actually have the exchange, um, right here. What's kind of interesting is, um, basically it's kind of like the, how the kidneys were working. You're going to have fluids and wastes and stuff flow into these spaces here and then flow into mama and then eventually get collected by the arteries that service the uterus and then go, or veins that service the uterus and then those are going to go away. Um, and then we've got the umbilical veins. Well, umbilical vein, I guess I should say. There's just one. Uh, that's going to bring stuff... Um, 
to the fetus. Now, here's another example of how you have to tell arteries taking blood towards the heart and veins taking blood away from the heart because umbilical veins take blood to the baby but away from the mother's heart. That's the reference point that you have to keep in mind. Um, so still going on about this time, uh, the embryo is um, now physically and developmentally distinct from the disc and the membranes. Um, and you can definitely see a head part and a tail part. Uh, around so around this time at 12 weeks is when organogenesis is going to start. That's that last stage of this development. Uh, that's that basically that marks the cutoff of the first trimester um, where the organs are going to form. Um, the rest of the stuff kind of moves pretty quickly. Um, we're not going to really go into a whole lot about the nitty gritty of how the different organs form. You just need to know where they come from. Um, developmental anatomy um, and embryogenesis are really, really interesting medical fields that I would highly recommend you go through um, and take a look at. But um, basically you've got, um, it starts off, you're gonna have neural folds and that's gonna start what's gonna end up, that's the start of what's going to end up being the brain and the spinal cord. Um, You'll have uh, other little blocks right in here that are going to become the muscles and vertebrae that are around the back. Um, you'll have another tube that forms. It's going to basically be the esophagus and what's going to turn into the alimentary canal. Um, you can see here around week four, there's a definite head with a definite eye. And here's a definite tail with a little tiny leg bud. Um, after about week eight, it's going to start look, it's looking less like an alien, still looks like an alien, but less like an alien after week 12, getting to the end of the first trimester. Um, it's even more baby like you're starting to get more definition with fingers and toes and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Uh, moving into the second trimester, um, the fetus is going to go faster than the surrounding placenta. Um, before they were kind of pacing each other. And so the placenta and the fetus were about the same size. Now we're going to start to see the fetus grow significantly larger than the placenta. Um, you're going to have the amnion and chorion fused. That's going to form something called the amniochorionic membrane. Um, and that's going to be really important. Um, that's a sort of barrier. And we'll talk about that later once we get to the childbirth part. Um, you get through this part, you're going to get to the third trimester. Um, so let me back up. Second trimester is organ formation, basically. Um, end of the second trimester is going to mark the point where the organs are basically formed. Now baby's just going to get big. Okay. Um, growth rate is going to slow down, but baby's going to put on weight. Um, and... Uh, as the baby enlarges, it's going to displace a lot of mama's organs at that point. And so then if you've heard complaints about like shortness of breath, having to pee all the time, stuff like that, that's what's happening here. Uh, there's a lot of hormones. We, let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, and some of the changes that are going to take place between mama and baby. Um, the syncytiotrophoblast is going to release uh, a number of different hormones. Okay. Um, including human chorionic gonadotropin, human placental lactogen, placental prolactin, relaxin, progesterone, and estrogen. Finally, we're in for, to some familiar territory. Um, and those last two are basically to sort of halt any sort of um, uh, ovulation and uh, uterine cycle processes, because we don't need that stuff to happen. We don't need another egg to come out. We don't need to, f definitely don't need to flush that endometrium out. Um, and so that's gonna sort of stop that sort of thing. Um, some of the ones we're going to talk about, though, uh, HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. Um, it, it appears pretty soon after implantation. Um, this is the hormone that if you do a blood or a urine test, that's what we are detecting on. That's why these, uh, some of the testing information says that you have to wait um, a few days or a week 
before you think you're pregnant or before conception, after conception to test it because implantation hasn't taken place. Um, and this is going to allow the corpus luteum to persist for three to four months while the baby is building up its processes um, uh, and structures and stuff like that. Human placental lactogen is another one. And that's going to start the mammary glands to uh, now to start getting ready for um, milk production. So one of the effects, secondary characteristics, I don't know what you're tall about it, of pregnancy is breasts in females and large. And that's because they're gearing up for that milk production. Okay. Um, they also stimulate other uh, the production of other t uh, growth and production of other tissues and stuff like that. Um, we're going to make sure that once baby is born, mama is ready right at the very beginning to produce um, milk, primarily glucose and protein, and then it kind of turns into milk a little bit later. We've got placental prolactin, um, which is going to convert the mammary glands to active status. Relaxin um, is released by the placenta. It's going to increase the flexibility of the pubic sisyphus. That is that little gap in between the two halves of the pelvis, which is going to allow the pelvis to expand. Um, it's also going to cause the dilation of the cervix, which is going to make the fetus more easily enter the vaginal canal and then leave. It's going to release the suppression of oxytocin, which is going to stimulate contractions, which we'll talk about later. Um, what else? What else? Uh, changes to mama. Um, baby is completely 100% dependent on mama while baby is in the womb. Um, that's nourishment. That's respiration. Um, it's, not a, it's, it's not like baby has a snorkel. Okay. And waste removal. So it's kind of gross, ladies. If you have a baby... One, especially once that digestive tract and the excretory tract forms, um, like baby's making waste and you're getting rid of it. So some of what you're getting rid of is, is from baby. Um, so lots of increases. Mama's got to increase stuff to basically take up the slack. Um, the, so respiratory rate and tidal volume, the amount of oxygen you breathe in and out is going to increase. Your blood volume is going to increase by almost 50%. Your nutrient intake is going to increase from 10% to 30%. So you're going to be eating more, right? Um, your kidneys are going to be working uh, at an increased rate, right? Because you're filtering excess waste that the baby is producing out of your blood. Um, and the uterus is going to expand and get bigger. And the mammary glands are also going to expand and get bigger. Here's some other changes that are going to take place. So about 16 weeks, baby kind of sits nestled right in your pelvis, okay, in that nice little spot. Um, so it's it's common enough not for pregnancy not to be noticeable at this point, okay. Um, as we go through those faster growth processes and stuff like that, though, we will start to see... Um, changes. And so what we see is the most superior position. That's where the head is basically. Um, because baby kind of sits crisscross applesauce on your pelvis ladies. Um, and then your head is up here. And so you can see on the outside, how much space, uh, baby takes up until right before delivery, baby drops a couple of days beforehand. Um, just to sort of get ready. And baby's also going to turn around as well, uh, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, this one, so uh, this is probably one of my favorite two diagrams that we've ever looked at as we're going through here. So this should look familiar. It's a sectional view of the uh, abdominal pelvic cavity of a woman. Okay, normal woman, you can see, um, you can see part of the colon here. Here's the small intestine. Um, no, I'm sorry, that was the stomach. That's part of the colon. Here's parts of the small intestine, um, pubic sisyphus. Here's the bladder, rectum, liver, diaphragm, right? Everything is where it's supposed to be, okay? Um, this is why women complain of shortness of breath, having to pee all the time, um, stuff like that. Because baby is just going to wreck shop. And trust me, they continue doing that. 
Um, so there's huge uh, changes that have to take place. This is full term right before baby is ready to come out. And you can see it's kind of flipped around, okay. Um, no, no, I was right. Okay, so before we, baby's still in here, here's just a like super quick review of development. Um, at four weeks, we've got an embryo that kind of looks like a, it's got a head. Um, after about eight weeks, we've got something that kind of looks like an alien, but it's, there's some human characteristics. By about 16 weeks, here we are getting towards um, middle-ish or so, baby looks like baby. All right, at that point, baby's just gonna bulk up, right? Get swole, as you will. And we're gonna move on, and then eventually we're going to get to the magic of childbirth, which is also known as parturition. Um, if you want a technical definition, it's the forcible expulsion of the fetus from the uterus. Eh, maybe baby doesn't wanna go. It's probably kinda nice in there. Um, that's gonna lead to labor, which are strong rhythmic contractions of the uterus. Um, triggered by the release of progesterone. Um, let me back up. Progesterone is going to stop contractions from taking place, right? Um, that's going to be released by the placenta, okay? It's going to inhibit smooth muscle contraction in the uterus. You may have heard something called Braxton Hicks contractions or false labor. Those are towards late in pregnancy. They're occasional spasms, not very strong. They're not regular. They're not persistent. Um, true labor is uh, initiated by a number of different factors. Um, one of them is the release of oxytocin, um, which is going to increase regular forceful contractions. Okay, so here we are. Baby's decided that baby's coming, okay? Um, this is what, where baby is, what it looks like right before um, birth is taking place. One of the few first um, sort of uh, forms, uh, signals that baby's ready to come out is by uh, putting pressure on the cervix. That's gonna start a positive feedback loop. Uh, which is going to sort of send a wave-like uh, contraction through the uterus um, to the cervix. They're going to increase in t force, so they're going to get harder, and frequency, they're going to get faster, uh, moving the fetus towards the cervical canal, getting them ready to get out of here. Um, and so then labor will be commencing. And there's three stages to labor. There's the dilation stage, the expulsion stage and the placental stage. Let's start with the dilation stage. So the dilation stage, um, baby is putting pressure on, um, baby's putting pressure on the um, cervix. The cervix is going to start enlarging up until 10 centimeters or so. Um, this is where the positive feedback loop is going to uh, is going to start kicking in. This process can last anywhere from an hour to dozens of hours, uh, where contractions will slowly increase in um, force and frequency up until we reach the expulsion stage. Once the cervix has uh, expanded to ten centimeters. Um, and contractions are gonna reach maximum um, intensity, baby's gonna start coming out at this point. Um, this stage typically lasts less than two hours. So once baby wants to come out, baby's coming out. Um, this stage is gonna continue until baby has fully emerged from the vagina and is ready to greet the outside world. Now, um, there are, um, uh, I, I need to, Let me back up. Okay, sorry. So uh, once baby comes out, that's known as delivery. You may have heard um, some folks have talked about something known as an episiotomy. That's a small uh, incision in the musculature of the perineum uh, uh, around the vagina. Uh, and that's basically done if the vaginal canal is deemed to be too small so the baby can't come out. It's a very common procedure and then it's usually repaired right after delivery with a few sutures. Once baby comes out, um, he's 
he or she is rated based off of something called an APGAR score. It's an assessment of uh, health in five areas. Appearance, does it look normal? Pulse, does it have one? Grimace, does it look unhappy? Activity, is it starting to move? And respiration, um, that's the scream, basically. Is it breathing on its own actual air? Because up until this point, it's had uh, amniotic fluid in its lungs, okay? Um, each criterion reads a score from zero to two. Uh, a normal healthy baby gets a score of eight to 10. Okay. Uh, then after that kind of low key, everybody is sort of like just taking a breath or cleaning the baby, stuff like that is the placental stage. You've got muscle contractions of the uterine wall. They're going to eject the, um, the placenta. And um, this is usually happening within an hour of uh, delivery of the um, uh, it ends within the hour uh, uh, after baby is delivered with the ejection of placenta, also known as ap afterbirth. There's also some blood loss because the placenta is basically ripped from the uterus. Um, sometimes things go wrong. You have premature labor. You're starting too early. Um, baby hasn't completed normal development yet. Um, and baby's chances of survival are directly related to baby's body weight. The heavier baby is, the more likely baby is to survive. You've got two different classifications. You have immature delivery. Um, that's babies 25 to 27 weeks old by the time um, it's born. Unfortunately, they're just, they're born too early. So most, um, most babies die despite intensive care. Um, survivors have a high risk of develop developmental abnormalities. They're not doomed to have them, but it's very likely. You can also have premature delivery, which is 28 to 36 weeks. So maybe they just came a little early, basically. Um, with care, newborns have a good chance of surviving and developing normally. Basically, however many weeks they are early, they have to spend in the hospital developing before they can go home. Um, other difficulties in deliveries, uh, sometimes forceps are used. There's actually some controversy with this one because of um, possible neurological consequences and stuff like that. But basically, um, uh, if baby's facing the wrong way, basically, um, baby's facing the pubis, so the front instead of the sacrum, basically the back. Um, and so the forceps are used, they grab onto the baby's head and they're used to help guide the baby out. Um, however, if used successfully, they do reduce the risk of to infants and mothers. Like I said, there is some controversy about their use um, uh, because of potential side effects, basically. Uh, there's also something known as the breech birth. Baby's flipped around, essentially. It's coming out feet first or butt first instead of head first. Um, the problem is the umbilical cord can become constricted, cutting off blood flow, endangering the baby. Um, the cervix may not dilate enough to pass the head because you don't have that pressure on it that the head um, is creating. It's going to prolong delivery um, and sub suspect, subject baby to distress and injury through an already uh, stressful situation. Um, if things get bad enough, you could do a cesarean section known as a C-section where basically baby is surgically removed by making an, an incision through the abdominal wall. Uh, one of three deliveries in the United States are C-section. They're incredibly common. Lots of different risk factors, age, diabetes, multiple birth, um, stuff like that. You can have twins. Uh, sometimes you have to have twins take out by cesarean section. Two types of twins, twins. Fraternal twins, dizygotic twins. Uh, that means you have two separate oocytes are fertilized. Uh, it happens pretty frequently with um, uh, fertility treatments and stuff like that. Um, they are two distinct individuals. They are not genetically identical. Monozygotic twins or identical twins result from either separation of the blastospheres during blastomeres during cleavage or the splitting of the inner cell mass before gastrulation into two separate individuals. The genetic makeup is identical because it came from the same cell line um, and the same pair of gametes. How are we doing so far? I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to go quick because we're we're getting about to the time I want to, I want to, I want to be stopping. If you need to take a break, take a break. Go ahead and do a pause. If not, I'm going to keep going. 
So rate super quick. Uh, twins happen out of one every 89 births. Triplets are one out of 79, 21. Quadruplets are even more. Um, conjoined twins or genetically identical twins. Um, there was incomplete um, splitting of the blastomeres or the embryonic disc. Um, so you basically have cells that are conjoined and they develop uh, into a baby. So baby is born. We have life. Everybody's celebrating. Dad's passing out cigars or the gum flavored cigars or, you know, whatever they're doing. Um, now, outside life can begin. We're going to divide this up into several different stages. Neonatal, infancy, childhood, adolescence, maturity. Uh, and then after maturity takes place, you have the process known as senescence. That's aging once you've matured. Um, and ultimately leads to death. So let's talk about stages, okay? Uh, neonatal is about the first month of life. Infancy continues through the first year or so of life. And then at that point, you're a little child. It's your childhood that starts into adolescence, going into like 12-ish, let's say, or so, until between the age of 18 and 25, when you are considered an adult. Uh, puberty is characterized primarily by uh, development of secondary sexual characteristics, increase in sex hormones, gametogenesis, stuff like that. The neonatal period. Uh, there's two major events that occur. The first one, um, organ systems are going to become fully operational at this point, and individuals are going to grow rapidly and body proportions are going to change significantly. When baby's born, he's mostly head and body. Um, and then as baby gets bigger, it's going to be more evenly distributed between head, body, and um, legs. Uh, it's important to see a pediatrician. The pediatricians will study specifically postnatal development from infancy to adolescence. A lot of pediatricians will also do grown-up medicine also and do family practices, so that's kind of cool. So the neonatal period is when you are a fetus to a neonate i.e. a newborn. Um, respiratory, circulatory, digestive, and urinary are all going to work on their own. They breathe on their own, they eat on their own, they poop on their own, they pee on their own. Um, they can't control their body temperature, so they have to be swaddled a lot, um, but they're going to learn how to do that. And they're dependent on nutrients contained in milk. Now, what's kind of interesting, mama doesn't just make milk right off the bat. She makes something called colostrum. Uh, within the first two or three days, of uh, birth. It's got lots of proteins, lots of um, glucose and stuff like that. A lot of those proteins are antibodies. That's where that, um, uh, where baby gets a lot of its immunity and uh, uh, immune system and stuff like that until its own immune system picks up. Um, and it's going to inhibit the replication of uh, different types of viruses that can attack the baby. After that, mama's going to start producing breast milk. The uh, milk is water, proteins, amino acids, lipids, sugars, and salts. And um, it's got lysozymes, which have antibiotic properties. Uh, that's going to get us into... Um, so breast milk is released by something called the milk ejection or the letdown reflex. Uh, so basically what happens is baby stimulates the mama's nipple by suckling. That's going to um, trigger the release of oxytocin, um, so on and so forth. I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. Um, and so basically the letdown reflex is going to continue until after baby is weaned. Typically one to two years, you, uh, revolts, results may vary. So here's the, here's another feedback loop, basically. Uh, one, the tactile receptors are going to be stimulated. That's going to send uh, messages to your spinal cord, which is going to go to your pituitary. That's going to release oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to be released. That's going to go back to the um, mammary gland. That's going to stimulate the uh, ejection of the milk. Once baby stops suckling, that process stops and the milk starts coming out. So it's basically not just like a faucet that's left turn on. Left turn on. Um, now, if somebody complains that they're not producing a lot of milk, what could be the problem is there could be very low oxytocin levels for whatever reason. So maybe something to keep in mind. 
Um, now we've got infancy going into childhood. Uh, we've got a number of different hormones that are going to um, dictate growth. We've got human growth hormone, adrenal steroids, thyroid hormones. Um, growth doesn't occur uniformly. You have growth spurts. Um, and body proportions gradually change, as you can see in this picture here. Um, we've got definitely baby looking. Here's like toddler looking. You know, now we've got like little human. And then we've got like, this is why lions eat their young age. And now you grow up and you become a sassy business professional, um, basically. So, um, which is pretty accurate. I consider myself a sassy business professional. Maybe y'all, some of y'all would agree with me. I don't know. Um, other folks probably wouldn't say I'm sassy. They'd probably say I'm a butthole, but I agree to, you know, que sera, sera and all of that good stuff. So I want to talk about adolescence, this little sector right in here, AKA puberty. Um, generally in girls, it starts around 11 boys. It starts around 12. Um, hypothalamus is going to release, uh, good, uh, GNRH, gonadotropic releasing hormone, I think. Uh, that's going to increase the circulating levels of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone. Uh, ovarian and testicular cells are going to become more sensitive to these cells. Um, and so you're going to have sex specific changes, you know, basically male characteristics and female characteristics that we talked about in the last video. That process is going to go until between, uh, 18 or so in girls, up upwards into 25 for boys. Um, that's why ladies, um, when you are in your teens, guys still act like idiots because we're kind of still kids. And it's not until we're in our mid twenties that we actually sort of mature and become adults. Some people never do. Um, at that point you are mature. You are a mature adult like Mr. Thompson because that's what people call me. Um, you begin aging, that's senescence. Uh, you start to have reduced function of various organ systems, um, various mechanisms kind of start to go out of whack and stuff like that. Um, changes at the molecular level that are taking place ultimately stack up and lead to death. Uh, that gets us into geriatrics, which is the study of aging and the problems associated with aging. So effects of aging on the organ systems, uh, let's see, a lot of these we've talked about in the specific organ system. Uh, loss of elasticity in skin produces sagging and wrinkling. Uh, decrease in the rate of bone deposition leads to weak bones and joint degeneration. Reduce reduction in muscle strength and ability. Impairment in coordination, uh, memory, intellectual function. Uh, reduction in production of circulating hormones. Um, cardiovascular problems, um, and reduced peripheral blood flow, reduced sensitivity to the immune system, leading to greater incidence of disease, uh, decreased respiratory function, uh, decreased peristalsis and muscle tone during the digestive tract, um, decreased muscle tone and peristalsis in the urinary system and decreased, uh, filtration rate, uh, impairment of the reproductive system and eventually becoming inactive. Woo, that's why some people say getting old sucks. Um, but I mean, that's basically it, I guess. Um, the following slides, I'll just kind of click through them real quick, unless you have, a, unless you have someplace you have to be. Um, I'm going to keep going. So I would recommend going into the lecture slides and taking these. These are reviews of development of, the, of what organ systems and tissue types come from the different germ layers. Um, that's all three of them. We've also got development of the major skeletal system and what's happening basically at each, um, month or so. And then, um, after birth, basically, um, uh, going forward from there. So I would definitely recommend taking a look at those. Uh, if you haven't watched the next video in our lecture series, please do so right now. If you have already watched that one, maybe because it was a little bit shorter, congratulations, you're finished. 
You don't have to listen to a recording of my mellifluous, melodious voice anymore. If you have any questions, let me know and remind uh, or email or comments on here or something. I don't know. Um, make sure you like and subscribe. That's what my son says I'm supposed to say. Um, so thank you. And I will see y'all later.